Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shannon Stewart. I'm the Vice President Development at the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation. And I am absolutely delighted to be here today to host today's webinar on this most beautiful spring day. Isn't it delightful? Um, on that note, if some of you are experiencing the thunderstorm that many of us are right now, you may have some connectivity issues, uh, you may drop out, fret not, this webinar will be recorded and will be distributed after the fact so you can uh, catch up and stay tuned to anything you may have missed thanks to Mother Nature's interference. But we greatly appreciate you joining us today. I know everyone involved here has busy schedules, uh, but we're just delighted that you're spending some time with us today to learn more about sarcoma and the exciting advancements happening in the Sarcan Sarcoma Program, uh, sorry, Sarcoma Cancer Program at the Princess Margaret. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to our incredible community of donors for your support and commitment, not only to the Princess Margaret, but to this program. You rally around us so generously to support research that helps save lives and improve the quality of life for cancer patients. So on behalf of everyone uh, at the Princess Margaret, the people that you'll hear from today and everyone that their work impacts, thank you. Um, while cancer incidence is indeed on the rise, we are making incredible progress thanks to the brilliant minds of the clinicians and researchers, some of whom you will hear from today. So we're here to talk about sarcoma. And for those of you who may not be aware, sarcoma is a rare form of cancer that actually accounts for less than 1% of adult cancer cases. It affects the body's connective tissues. So our nerves, muscles, joints, bone, fat, and blood vessels, and due to its rarity, there's been really limited data available to help clinicians and researchers understand and best treat this disease. In fact, if you were to look for statistics on the incidence of sarcoma, and I know this because I did it myself, um, in the annual work published by the Canadian Cancer Society and Health Canada, you won't find sarcoma on the list at all. That's how rare it is. But we know what the numbers are. And we know that there's about 2,500 new cases per year in Canada. A thousand of those cases are in Ontario. And what's fascinating about our program is we treat 40% of Canada's cases and 85% of the cases in Ontario. So we know sarcoma at the Princess Margaret. And this is one of the reasons why we are so proud to have one of the largest programs in North America and are actually engaged in making advances in research to improve treatment and care for this patient population. We know how important it is to dedicate resources and energy to improving these outcomes because this is such a life-changing form of cancer. And this research has largely been supported by philanthropy. So quite simply, thank you. Thank you for your time, energy, donations, and interest in this space. Before I introduce today's panelists, I'd just like to highlight the question and answer function in the Zoom portion of where we are today. You're welcome to use this feature at any point during our conversation. Feel free to populate that with any questions you may have. Our panelists will be able to see them. And we've allotted some time at the end of the formal presentation to, so that we can have these questions answered for you. Um, so in just a moment, you're going to, in, you're going to meet Drs. Peter Ferguson, Abadupta, and Hagit perez Saroka will provide an overview of this program that I keep referring to as incredible because it truly is at the Princess Margaret. You'll also have an opportunity to meet our special guest, Patrick Wilson, and hear about his own cancer journey and his role as a catalyst in the development of the Canadian Sarcoma Research and Clinical Collaboration, also known as CANCER. So we can talk a little bit, we'll talk a lot about that. So without further delay, because of course, I'm not the person you came here to hear from today, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Peter Ferguson. He is the sarcoma site group lead at the Princess Margaret. He's an orthopedic oncologist and the Albert and Tammy Latner Professor and Chair of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Toronto. He's won numerous teaching awards, including the Robert Salter Award from the Division of Orthopedic Surgery, the Bruce Tovey Undergraduate and Postgraduate Award from the Department of Surgery, and the AMS Donald Richards Wilson Award from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada. In addition, Dr. Ferguson has authored over 170 publications on clinical outcomes of patients with sarcoma, surgical education, and translational research in radiation effects on bone and soft tissue healing. So welcome, Dr. Ferguson, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Shannon. And uh, you know what? I, um, I now have a new logo that we can use. We know sarcoma. I love that. I think that was, uh, that was fantastic. I'm going to start utilizing that 
if it's okay with you. Okay, so um, it's real a pleasure to uh, to be here today and to uh, to speak to everybody about our sarcoma program. Give a, you know a thirty thousand foot view of of sarcoma, what it is that we do at Princess Margaret and Mount Sinai. It's a combined program. Some of our achievements, and then to hand over to my my colleagues, Doctors Gupta and uh, Peretz, for um, some more information on things such as our, our Canadian initiatives. Uh, let's see. Okay, and thanks to, to uh, Shannon and the Princess Margaret Foundation for uh, giving us this forum to speak to you. And thanks to all of you for coming out to listen and for showing your interest. We really appreciate it and your ongoing support. I want to put a face to sarcoma, okay? I, I would argue this is probably the most famous uh, patient certainly in Canada and Canadian history and maybe even world history who's had sarcoma. And this is, of course, uh, Terry Fox. He was diagnosed in the late 70s with osteosarcoma, which is a, a type of a bone cancer. And at the time, really, the only treatment was, was amputation. And uh, he decided he wanted to raise money for cancer. He set out uh, a goal of raising a million dollars and he was gonna run across Canada. So as, as people know, he ran a marathon a day, 42 kilometers a day for almost six months from April to uh, September of 2000 and, or sorry, of uh, 1980 before he had to stop because his cancer had metastasized. And he ran on this this horrible, horrible ancient type of prosthesis, which was like uh, like a piece of wood, um, and so you know the agree the amount of of sort of fortitude and dedication and intensity that it took to do to do this, it just I don't think we can all comprehend. Unfortunately, however, uh, his disease did spread. He stopped his run in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and this is just outside Thunder Bay, this Terry Fox Memorial. Uh, forever a tribute to his legacy. I'm going to ask you, this is going to sound weird, but I ask you to just take a look at this fence right here, okay, and keep that in mind. So let's skip forward uh, 30 or 40 years. What has happened? Well, I'm going to show you a couple of modern examples of sarcoma just to show that we, what we have achieved. So this is going to be a little bit foreign to you. These are MRI scans um, of, a, uh, of a patient who I'm going to describe. This is the leg. So this is the femur bone. And this is down near the knee. And this big dark thing here and here is a big osteosarcoma. This is the chest x-ray on that same patient. This is a big tumor in the lungs. And this is the CAT scan. This is a big tumor in the lung right here. So this is a patient with osteosarcoma who um, oh, I met in about 2007. Dr. Gupta and I shared this patient. Um, when we met her, she had this huge tumor in her knee, which was causing her terrible pain. Her cancer had already spread to her lungs, and, and she was really on the cusp of being considered palliative and untreatable. Well, due to sort of modern technology, modern chemotherapy, modern surgical techniques, uh, she received chemotherapy. We were able to remove the tumor in her knee whoops, put in a prosthesis right here. So she's got an artificial bone. She had surgery to remove the tumors from her lungs. Three years later, when the uh, Olympics were in Vancouver and the torch was going across the country, uh, she was nominated by her school to carry the torch. And here's that fence I was talking about right here. This is at the Terry Fox Memorial. So this was three years after her diagnosis in 2010. I saw this young lady in my office yesterday. She's 15 years out from her original treatment and she is cancer free. She's getting married this year. She's uh, what, I guess 31 years old now. Um, and this is a great example of what contributions to cancer research such as you all are making has allowed us to achieve in the last several years. I wanna show another example. This is a, uh, a young gentleman uh, named Tyler. Um, he had uh, uh, aspirations to become a professional hockey player. Uh, he unfortunately broke his leg through a sarcoma in his, uh, in his tibia, in his shin bone. 
and that necessitated an amputation. And rather than stewing about it and pining about what could have been, uh, he remained determined to become a hockey player. And he is now the captain of Canada's sledge hockey team. And here he is with his Olympic gold medal from the 2014 Olympics in Sochi. So we have improved. We have uh, made tremendous strides in the, in, the, in the outcomes of patients with sarcoma as evidenced by these two individuals, but we're not there yet. There's lots that we still need to do. So um, sarcoma, as you've heard, is a very rare type of cancer, arises from, from what are, what's called mesenchymal tissue. So in the body, that's really anything that is not the organs, you know, the lungs, kidneys, uh, you know, the, the intestines and so on. Those are all organs. They develop different types of cancers, tissues such as bone and cartilage and fat and, and muscle. These are all mesenchymal tissues. So cancer that arises in those are called sarcomas. Uh, they comprise about 1% of all cancers. And we usually, I guess, somewhat haphazardly divide them into bone and soft tissue sarcomas, all right? And the treatment of these are a little bit different. Usually these were named for the type of tissue that they came from. And here's some examples right here that I've listed, but more recently, um, due to advances in, in sort of genetics and advanced diagnostics, uh, newer types of sarcomas are being discovered all the time that are described based on the specific genetic abnormality and mutation that they have. So the treatment for sarcomas almost always involves surgery. There, are, it, it's very unusual that we do not offer surgery to these patients. If they're in the extremities where the majority of them are in the arms and legs, then myself and my partners take, take care of them. They can be in the abdomen, they can be in the head and neck, they can be virtually anywhere in the body and then different, uh, different surgical colleagues will look after them. And the goal is complete removal of the tumor and potentially reconstruction of any and all of the tissues that we have to remove. If it's a soft tissue sarcoma, such as uh, what we've described here on the left side, we often use radiation. For soft tissue sarcomas, we sometimes use chemotherapy. For bone sarcomas, we frequently use chemotherapy. And that's one of the important differences between the two. So, so that's an overview of what sarcoma is. I wanna talk a little bit about our group. And, and uh, I will tell you that, you know, we, we try to be modest, I will tell you that, but you know, I would put us up against any sarcoma unit, not only in North America, but anywhere in the world, when it comes to the achievements that we have made and contributions in sarcoma care, sarcoma research, and sarcoma education. So we're all very proud of, of our achievements. And, and when asked to describe what are the keys to the success of our group, um, I, I boiled it down into four, I think, main themes here, okay? There are probably many more, but these are, I think, the key contributions that we've made. I want to talk about a little bit of each of these in turn. Number one is collaboration. Okay, this is what I call the dream team. This is our team. Um, and this team is growing all the time. Um, when we put this slide together, when I, I was actually really happy to show this is a very diverse group of individuals. And, and I'm really proud that that is the case. We've got surgeons, we've got uh, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists, researchers, all of whom are invested in sarcoma care in Toronto. I would like to point out the top right here, this individual, David Kirsch. Um, he is gonna be joining us within the next uh, month or so. Uh, he is joining as the new head of radiation oncology at, uh, at the Princess Margaret. And you may have heard of the brain drain where the top Canadian scholars go south of the border uh, to glory in the US. Well, this is actually a reverse bit brain drain. I would argue that he is probably the most accomplished um, clinician, scientist, radiation oncologist maybe in the world. So the fact that he saw fit to come up to Princess Margaret is an enormous coup for us and I think speaks volumes of what we've been able to achieve and our reputation you know, on the world stage. Another example of collaboration is CANSARC, and you're gonna hear a lot about this with Drs. Gupta and, and, uh, and Peretz, and this is our, our Canadian um, alliance essentially, which allows us to collaborate with our colleagues across the country in sarcoma outcomes. 
just a couple of examples of some international studies that we've done with colleagues. This is um, a study, a surgical study done, uh, uh, I think it finished up last year. It's called Parity, and this was run out of Hamilton. Uh, but this is looking at antibiotics in people who are having uh, prostheses put in their legs for sarcoma surgery. Um, and if you take a look here, number two, because a surgery for a lot of these bone sarcomas is done at Mount Sinai, we're the top accruing center. So most of the patients, the, ma the majority, uh, uh, not the majority in the study, but we're the highest recruiting center within this study that ultimately was the first randomized trial published in surgical oncology and sarcoma. This is another example right here. This is a CAT scan of an abdomen, and this is a huge sarcoma in the abdomen. And our colleagues in general surgery, Drs. Gladdy and Swallow and Brar, were instrumental in bringing this study here to fruition, this randomized trial. We've been instrumental in developing guidelines for sarcoma care that are um, applicable not only in Ontario, but across the world. This, is, uh, this was done in the late uh, 2000, 2009 here. Uh, Charles Catton, who is one of our radiation oncologists, was the lead author on this. And essentially what it did is spelled out how sarcoma care in Ontario should be carried out and described three um, essentially centers of excellence or host sites where the majority of sarcoma care should take place and every other place in Ontario should be aligned at one of or with one of these host sites. So this is a map of, Ont <coughs> excuse me, of Ontario. Everywhere in blue you see are, um, are regions of Ontario that are aligned with our host site in Toronto. Here's the other host site in Ottawa. What you see in yellow right now, um, or, or used to be aligned with Hamilton, the group in Hamilton is undergoing some transition and currently uh, we in Toronto look after everything that is yellow as well. So the only place that we don't look after is this in orange here. We look after the remainder of Ontario, which as you've heard is about 85%. And then we've developed these pathways that very, very specifically spell out what a family physician is supposed to do if they see somebody who's got a lump or bump in their arm or their leg, what steps they have to follow, how they should investigate these patients, and ultimately where they should be sent to us in Toronto or some of the other host sites for, for initial management. Cancer Care Ontario keeps track of the number of patients that are undergoing various different treatments of sarcoma. And this is an example here. This is back in 2015, 16, and this is over six months. And you see the vast majority of chemotherapy that gets administered for uh, for sarcoma is done at the two centers in Toronto between uh, Sinai and University Health Network. This is a lot of inpatient therapy at Mount Sinai and a lot of outpatient chemotherapy takes place at, at uh, Princess Margaret. And you see that dwarfs all the other sites in Ontario. Same thing with pathology, with advanced pathology, by far the majority in Ontario um, gets done at, um, at our sites here in Toronto. And similarly with surgery, when we're putting in prostheses or bone graft to reconstruct patients, uh, a huge, huge majority take place here in Toronto. I think another way that we establish ourselves on the world stage and um, are able to expand our footprint in, in sarcoma care is through education. So we have fellows that come from around the world to study under us in, in Toronto. Um, the information I have here is really surgical fellows, but this map would be even bigger if you looked at fellows in, uh, in medical and radiation oncology. Everywhere you see a star here represents a place where a clinical fellow has gone back to practice sarcoma surgery. Um, I'm happy to say that in a couple of years, we're going to have our first star in Africa, in South Africa. The other thing that's interesting to point out is you see the number of stars there are in the US. We have a lot of American fellows that come up here to train and go back and become leaders in the US. Again, sort of like a reverse brain drain, if you will. And here are a bunch of our fellows at a reunion we had a few years ago. Um, and it's a fairly diverse and very, very uh, uh, highly accomplished group. The last thing I just wanna talk about are some contributions uh, to research in sarcoma that we have made, and it, I could sit here for hours and hours spelling out the myriad of accomplishments 
I'm going to just going to bring this down to a few. Um, the Toronto Extremity Salvage Score, which is a functional outcome measure. If, if you're one of our patients and you've come and you've had surgery, no questionnaires that you fill out on a regular basis, that's what this is. This is something that was discovered, that was invented, devised in Toronto, and is the most widely utilized measure of patients' functional recovery after surgery worldwide. In the, uh, in the 90s, um, we conducted the first randomized clinical trial in radiotherapy in soft tissue sarcoma treatment. And this was published in, um, in uh, Lancet. And uh, the lead author was Dr. Brian O'Sullivan. This is a paper that is probably the most widely quoted and utilized um, sarcoma radiation oncology paper worldwide. Essentially what this showed is that patients who had radiation before surgery had a twice as high incidence of wound complications. And as a result, we've modified the way that we give radiation in order to try to help reduce the likelihood of those happening. This seems like a bit of an unusual slide, but this is a prosthesis um, that goes into people's arms or legs when they have a bone tumor surgery to remove sarcomas. This is a, a unique prosthesis that we are the only ones in the world that are authorized to use. Um, and we're the only ones that have essentially 100% success with this prosthesis binding to the bone and it provides long-term longevity. If you've heard about hip and knee replacements, you hear that, well, maybe they've got a lifespan of, of 10 to 15 years. Uh, we have not ever had to change one of these prostheses. And this was a, a prosthesis that was the concept of which was devised here in Toronto. And then finally, I just want to show a little bit about our newest uh, development. This is an image-guided surgery suite that we have in our uh, new operating rooms at Mount Sinai, where we utilize um, technology in order to be able to navigate our surgery. This is an example of one of our fellows here doing it on a, on a, uh, a replica. But we were able to, with very high precision, remove these tumors and reconstruct them with minimal um, uh, extra tissue that gets resected in order to maintain people's function afterwards. So those are just a few examples of some accomplishments uh, of the dream team here. Once again, I'm, I'm incredibly privileged to be a member of this, uh, of this fantastic team of individuals. Um, and I only hope that it will grow going forward and that uh, we'll be here in another five to 10 years touting uh, the uh, ongoing accomplishments of these fantastic individuals. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will hand off to our other speakers now. Thank you so much, Doctor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Doctor Perkins. And that was absolutely fantastic and uh, really uh, interesting. And I learned a lot, and I hope everyone else did. So thank you so much for sharing that. I'm very excited to introduce our next presenters to you now. So, Doctor Abagusta is a staff oncologist in our solid tumor program at the Princess Margaret. She's the founding medical director of Cancer. And uh, Dr. Gupta's primary clinical and research interests include sarcoma, adolescent and young adult oncology, and desmoid tumors. And presenting with her today is Dr. Hagi Perez Soroka. She's the Cancer Program and Scientific Manager at the Princess Margaret. Um, in her career, uh, Hagi strives to bridge the boundaries of chemistry, biology, physics, and material science. And over the years, she's built wonderful rapport with leading scientists, physicians, investors, donors, and patent attorneys, as well as uh, doing due diligence and technology transfer department. So uh, welcome to you both, Abba and Peggy. Thank you so much, um, Shannon, and to the foundation and to all of you for joining us today. Um, I will pull up my slides. <clears throat> So, um, so I will be speaking about the Canadian Sarcoma Research and Clinical Collaboration. Hagit and I have, um, I guess, founded this program and are continuing to endeavor to make this the best in the world. You will be meeting Patrick uh, in a little while. Patrick Wilson had, was, is one of my patients and had one simple request. He said, Dr. Gupta, why can we not capture the data and tissue from every single person who's been diagnosed with sarcoma across the country with an ultimate goal 
there he is, hi Patrick, with an ultimate goal to improve the outcome of patients with sarcoma. You heard from Shannon that um, there are uh, many individuals across the country who have been diagnosed with sarcoma. We would propose that probably this number is un in fact underestimated. And CANSARC is in fact a database where we hope to actually confirm the denominator. And in fact, before CANSARC, nothing like this ever existed before. So this is a quiz. You can answer, enter your um, answers in the chat. Um, where in the body does sarcoma occur? You've heard both our speakers um, say this already. I actually don't know if we'll see any. Oh, there we go. There we Perfect. go. There it is. I wasn't Perfect. sure if you see it in the chat. There it is. Correct. Excellent. So sarcoma occurs everywhere in the body. Um, and so this actually is an important entity to think about when we're considering collecting data for sarcoma. It is not just in one place in the body. People ask us also, how many types of sarcoma are there? We usually answer this question by saying there's more than 50. But in fact, the way I would suggest you think about this is like looking into a starry sky at night where the more you look, the more you see. In fact, our pathologists are identifying a new type of sarcoma or a new molecular subtype of sarcoma almost every two weeks. And to be honest with you, it's becoming increasingly difficult to understand how do we actually classify all of these different subtypes of tumors. So here we are. This is the mission for CANSARC. We, we have created a free platform for every single center in Canada to be able to have their, their patient data entered into a single unified database. With this, we hope and have actually um, facilitated clinical and scientific collaboration. We have virtual biobanking, which means not that we're collecting tissues, but rather we are identifying where that tissue is actually stored such that if anybody would like to do research in alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma or a very specific subtype, then we will be able to identify for them where that tissue is located across the country. We hope that by collecting data from across the country, we can actually explore patterns of disease to help inform future clinical trial design and actually help us further understand sarcoma biology. So the, the surgical oncologists in Toronto had a database already created and they used the technical platform called DATOS, which was housed at the University Health Network. So what we did at CANSARC is we leveraged this existing um, database platform and, and over the last few years, have tried to expand it. We did this, of course, by first expanding our team. Hagit um, was the first uh, person that we hired and she is really the engine behind everything that you're seeing today. We have been able to hire a research assistant and have also to help uh, date, collect the data and have also hired fellows to help conduct the research. We have a steering committee um, where, which helps oversee our activity. We have expanded the patient selection. So initially with the initial uh, Toronto database, patients who were seen by specific surgeons were entered. Now we have ensured that patients who are seen by medical oncology and radiation oncology, as well as other surgical clinics, such as head and neck um, surgeons or urologists, that those patients or individuals are also able to be tracked and consented and their data entered into the database. We have expanded the age um, and which I, uh, of patients in, included in the database, which I'll mention in the future. Um, and moreover, we have spent hours and hours trying to build the legal and um, ethical infrastructure to ensure that this can happen. So imagine every single hospital who has joined CANSARC needed to have a legal consortium agreement signed 
such that they can enter data for their patients into a single registry that every that we would have access um, to um, collating in order to provide this to scientists. Moreover, imagine that I have a de I have defined the date of diagnosis as maybe the date that a first CT scan was done, and my colleague in Calgary has decided that the date of diagnosis is the date the biopsy is performed. We have um, worked very hard to define a data dictionary such that even very basic parameters such, that, such as a date of diagnosis is unified between all centers. Hagit has actually worked very hard to also create educational modules so that we can teach other centers how to actually use the data dictionary and use the data platform. Hagit has also worked very hard at optimizing the um, DATOS technology and um, data optimization. Um, she has um, worked on quality assurance, data validation, data mapping, as well as post-processing procedures. So all of this has actually taken place over the last three years. Finally, we have worked on building a website. There are multiple functions of this website. The first is public outreach, but the second is also as a professional tool. We use this platform for connecting professionals across the country and also providing um, education to students and to healthcare providers. I wanted to highlight some of the scientists across the country who've actually already benefited from CanSARC. Dr. Shantanu Banerjee is a scientist at Cancer Care Manitoba. He is also one of our sarcoma leaders as he is a committee co-chair for the, Can the Canadian Clinical Trials Group. He says, CANSAR connects a rare disease population coast to coast and provides a basis for national cohorts and clinical trials. Dr. Marcelo Saipal is a thoracic surgeon here at the University Health Network in Toronto. He has told me that CANSAR enabled him to complete a review of extrapleural pneumonectomy for sarcoma, which is an innovative procedure for a rare disease. Dr. Catherine Hollow, sorry, Dr. Keller and Caroline Holloway is a radiation oncologist and a scientist in developmental radiotherapeutics from the BC Cancer Agency. She says that CANSARC is an initiative in which the entire group at BC Cancer has ex is excited to be a part of. She says that CANSARC has been proven to be efficient and effective way for national collaboration and for its potential for our patients. Our website has received a lot of traffic over the last three years. And in fact, we have been approached by companies, by universities and colleges to ask us to help uh, offer co-op programs for their students and by patients and families seeking more information about sarcoma and even seeking uh, second opinions. So our website is definitely working as an effective outreach tool. So I've, highlight, I've alluded to this previously, and the two patients that uh, Dr. Ferguson um, um, spoke about also portend to this new theme. Sarcoma is really the only adult cancer that is also common in children and in adolescents. And in fact, up to 15% of children and adolescents are affected by sarcoma. So it was very important to us to expand cancer to all ages. So here we did it. We have accomplished our initial goal, which was to engage 18 centers across the country, coast to coast in CANSARC. They have all signed legal agreements, all 18 sites, and therefore all have the capacity to enter data from the individuals with sarcoma in their local centers. Our team consists of over 100 members, including clinicians, researchers, data assistants, fellows, students at all levels, nurses, um, data technologists, and lawyers. At every site, we have an ambassador. That person is instrumental in communicating CANSAR to the rest of their team and to be the lead investigator for projects from their center. 
this type of collaboration has tightened on already small sarcoma community within the country and has also allowed young investigators, fellows and students to also join the team in a way that they hadn't previously done in the past. So as mentioned, prior to um, CANSARC developing, the University Health Network, Princess Margaret Cancer Center and Mount Sinai Hospital already had an established database in which over a thousand patients had been um, entered. After the development of CANSARC, we have been able to contribute and increase uh, the data entry for by 300%. The blue bar represents those patients who have been, um, whose data has been entered at Princess Margaret and Mount Sinai Hospital. But importantly, the red bar, part of this bar graph shows you the data contribution from all of the other Canadian sites into the database. So here we are. We have been able for the first time to actually collect data from across the country for individuals who have been affected by sarcoma. I would like to highlight a very important part of our program. And for Hagit and I, this has been an incredibly fulfilling um, part of CANSARC. We have mentored over 20 students as part of our program. And the mentorship occurs through our multidisciplinary team. Delaney Sharp is one such student. She joined CANSARC in 2021. She's doing her bachelor in biology and psychology at Queen's University. She has said that volunteering with CANSARC over the last two years has strengthened her passion and interest in clinical research and has provided a valuable opportunity to grow as a researcher while also learning from clinicians. Tristan Wild is a medical student at the University of Ottawa. He's an aspiring surgical oncologist and working with CANSARC has helped him develop his understanding of sarcoma and allowed him to actually scrub in with Dr. Nessim in an in a operation with a sarcoma patient. We have had many students who have applied for and successfully entered into, into secondary master's programs as well as uh, nursing programs. They have learned fundamentals of research, have been exposed to clinical care, have developed both soft and scientific skills, and have asked us for letters of recommendation to help them in their careers. And I am proud to report that two of our students have been accepted to master's programs at the University of Toronto and one student in a nursing program as well. It is so important to us to be able to pay it forward and, gen and foster interest in research and cancer research and in sarcoma for the next generation. So now moving on to the science. The list of projects that, that CANSARC has been involved in is increasingly growing. This is a list of some of the projects that we've already been part of. And as you can just see by glancing at the titles, every single project is of a different sarcoma subtype and possibly even it, of a sarcoma at a different place in the body. The head and osteosarcoma in the head and neck, maybe radiation induced sarcomas in children and in adults, as well as desmoid tumors and epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. We consider CANSARC the base, the nourishment, and this or the sustenance that can provide the clinical data to help big clinical pro sorry, big research programs that cannot exist without clinical data. I have listed a few examples of these currently running funded sar large sarcoma research programs, which we are collaborating with. One is Sarcoma Atlas Program, um, led by Dr. Adam Schlein at the Hospital for Sick Children. Second is a funded grant by the Sarcoma Cancer Foundation of Canada in collaboration with the EAG Foundation, um, led by Dr. Albi Razak. Next is an ultra rare sarcoma project, which is actually led by an Italian investigator named Silvia Stacchiotti and one of our newest sarcoma medical oncologists, Dr. Aziz is collaborating with her on this. The Desmoid Tumor Research Foundation has provided one of our Canadian investigators, Dr. Jonathan Nujem with a funded grant looking at pyrazine kinase inhibitors and desmoid tumors. And finally, Dr. Rebecca Gladdy is collaborating with the NIH 
in molecular profiling of rhabdomyosarcoma. CANSARC is providing the clinical data needed for all of these um, very important sarcoma research uh, projects. So in order for us to continue to move forward, we need data. And, and in order to help support all of these centers across the country to collect data, we do need ongoing um, financial support. I would like to just highlight one thing. Toronto is the only institution wherein Dr. Ferguson, myself, and all of the members that he showed in his photo of the Dream Team have the privilege of tr only treating one cancer type, and that is sarcoma. In every other institution across the country, all of our colleagues treat sarcoma as well as many other cancer types. And therefore, their time and the time of their research teams is spread amongst their entire cancer center. This is important in terms of the support that they need in order to do sarcoma specific research. Funding is also required in order for us to expand our student program. We would like to actually offer official co-op placements for students and together with student mentorship and student um, support, we will be able to further increase our ability to capture data for all patients in order to move forward sarcoma research and clinical collaboration. For all those families and patients who have been affected by sarcoma, either in the present or the past, we are grateful. We are grateful for your attention and we are grateful for your ongoing support. And we would like to give back. And one way that we are doing this is on May 31st, we invite you to participate in a patient symposium. This will be a hybrid meeting held at the University Club of Toronto in which we have gathered together experts in supportive care for patients and families undergoing a sarcoma journey. We have um, Hagit and I who will be speaking about cancer. We have Dr. Covelli who will be speaking about the pros and cons of virtual care. Janusha Sriram is one of our research assistants as part of our sarcoma program, and she also has a master's in music therapy and will be speaking to this. Dr. Chang is an amazing physiatrist who will speak about the importance of physical activity. Hannah Kornblum is um, an adolescent medicine um, trained physician who is also an expert in psychosocial oncology and will be speaking about managing mental health during and after cancer therapy. And finally, we have closing remarks from one of our surgical oncologists, Dr. Brar. So I encourage you to register for the Toronto Sarcoma Symposium and hope to see you there. Thank you again for your support and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a fabulous, um, a wonderful overview and um, do be sure to register for that symposium if you have the opportunity to do so. The Toronto Sarcoma Symposium.com is the, the website to register. We'll be sure that that's included in the, the follow-up that goes out as well so that you can uh, take advantage of that. I want to thank um, Hagib as well. She's been answering questions in the chat at the same time in the Q&A section, which is amazing. So we can make sure that all of your questions do get answered as we go. Um, and I am very excited now to, to ask Abba to come back quickly and introduce us to our uh, special guest who's joining us today, Patrick Wilson. Patrick is joining us from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, because of course, uh, and we're super excited to hear about how the two of you uh, kind of came together and, and continue to move, uh, develop cancer and move it forward. So Abba, back to you. Sure. Thank you, Patrick, for taking the time to join us. We know you're a busy student and um, or have assignments and exams coming up. So, um, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> thanks. So you and I have known each other for quite some time, but maybe you can actually share a little bit about your cancer journey through Princess Margaret. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess I'll, I'll start with, I, when we first met, I was, um, I had, been in Florida, I was water skiing, and I was on top of the world. I was doing my undergrad, weather was great. <laughs> um, my parents 
had a tough time convincing me to come home for the March break, but um, something wasn't right. And I had tried to seek some treatment um, in the, the city that the school was in and nothing really came of it. And I came home and my mom forced me to go uh, to the hospital because I'm a bit of a stubborn one. And so I went and um, next thing I know, I'm being told that I have been diagnosed with stage four uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. And at this point, we didn't know if it was alveolar or embryonal. And I think we actually started treatment for alveolar. And I remember having that conversation with you where you had told me that we had never seen treatment at Princess Margaret for that strain. And so it's a tough pill to swallow, but you keep going. And, and so we ended up starting, I went through nine months of chemotherapy, um, four months of radiation. And that was at uh, both Princess Margaret. And I, a goal of mine was to get back down to school um, while I was on treatment. And so I, I never would have been able to do it without Dr. Gupta uh, and the team's help and support throughout that whole situation. She um, introduced me to people at Moffitt, which is another uh, cancer center down south. And so I've had the opportunity to be treated at um, Mount Sinai and, and UHN um, uh, down south in, in Florida and uh, now recently at Emory. Yes, Patrick, you have had um, a very long cancer journey for sure, and um, you know have had to receive care in multiple places. And despite that, it's just so impressive that you've graduated from college. You, you're still, you know, you're still able to ski. I mean, it's amazing, and you're still continuing to study. So, really, congratulations and hats off to that. I wanted to ask you, kind of, what led in your mind to the establishment of the Wilson Sarcoma Research Fund and this particular partnership? Yeah, absolutely. So I remember having a conversation with my grandfather about how everything was going and some thoughts. And so when I first got diagnosed, I remember hearing that it was typically found more in pediatrics at the time. And given that I was over 18, I was going to be treated um, likely as an adult, and if I could tolerate it more, then we might be able to amp up the dose to treat more like a pediatric. And and as I found out more and more, I was, really didn't understand why when we did a biopsy, that tissue didn't get banked, because it sounded to me like we have a, a rare case, a stage four um, cancer kid that, uh, you know, it just sounded like something that really should have been stored. And then you start doing a little bit of digging and we found out that they're, they didn't have the funding to do it. And so that was really eye-opening to me, my family. And I think that's when we realized we needed to make, to do something to make difference. And so it started with banking that tissue, but also if there's only X amount of cases in Toronto, then would it be possible to collaborate with other centers across the country? Because the more data you have on it, the better outcomes there could be for, for patients. And so that was really what, what started it. And it sounds like it's gone fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And honestly, without your help and your family's help, uh, you know, this would not exist. So really it's amazing. Um, in the last 30 seconds, maybe you could, tell me from your point of view, why do you think it's important for philanthropy um, and support to the Princess Margaret? Why, why is, that, is that important and why? Yeah, absolutely. I think you almost nailed it in, in the preamble before the question. It's that without that money, we wouldn't, like none of this would have been possible. That like the funding needed to be there to then start um, saving the tissue to then build out that, that database. And so it's really important from what I've found is that these rare cancers, because there's not as many people that get it every year, they almost get passed over a little bit. And so it really takes funding from the private sector to, to throw some fuel on that fire. 
And so I think it's really important. Do you think that, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Do you think that Princess Margaret is a leading cancer center when it comes to clinical care and research? It's a trick question. Uh, like, absolutely, no questions asked. I think that having been at two of the top cancer centers in the US, um, and also a not good center who completely misdiagnosed me. So I won't even touch on that. But having seen the team, I think that's what really um, opened my eyes to how good Princess Margaret and the team that we have up in Toronto is. It When I first went down to Moffitt and I met with some of the doctors, they were very quick to tell me that Princess Margaret and Dr. Gupta were the best in the world at this. And so it was... And obviously, they don't tell you that when I walk in the hospital because it might come across as arrogant. But when you start talking to other people, surgeons down here, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I met Dr. Swallow. She came down and taught us how to do a whole bunch of stuff. And it's just you start hearing these different things. You're like, wow, I, wow they're really good back home. <laughs> you know, it, I hope it's OK if I share, Patrick, that um, to all of everyone who's listening, Patrick had an incredibly, um, incredibly intense uh, operation and in his pelvis. And, you know, before this surgery that you had, Patrick, we were worried, you know, would you be able to walk again? And mm -hmm. can you tell everyone what you can do now? Yeah, absolutely. So do you want me to give a little background on the surgery too? I, I don't mind. Sure. So, um, Basically, after I finished my undergraduate degree, I was all excited to start moving on with my career, uh, but life had different plans. And so my cancer had come back and I had already had two rounds of radiation. And so uh, we couldn't do anything more in that department. And so we went through, I think, four or five months of chemo to shrink the tumor to try and get better outcomes. And they ended up doing a full uh, pelvic Excentration. So they removed my uh, bowel, prostate, bladder, rectum, and so uh, including a lot of bones in there. And so it, it's been a very difficult, it was a long, difficult recovery. Um, and it, like Dr. Gupta kind of alluded to, I started off learning how to walk again. And so it's been very difficult. But at the same time, I've been working my tail off to try and not just get back to where I used to be, but continue to push the envelope in all aspects of life. And I think what Dr. Gupta was alluding to is I uh, competed a little bit in back to water skiing, which is my my sport this summer. And so it's been it's been quite the journey, but I think at the end of the day, it, it builds character and uh, I, I'm better for it. Thank you so much, Patrick really for, I mean, not only your support and your family support, but also your resilience. And um, you will always have a special place for me. So thank you so much for joining us today. I know you've been so busy with school. Really appreciate it. Thanks. No, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thanks don't, for everything you've leave, done. Don't leave just yet, Patrick. I see Dr. Ferguson has his hand up. So I'm curious if he's got something that he wants to ask or to add in before we no. wrap up. No, I just, I, I like, Patrick, how are you? It's been a while. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I think the fact that you are back water skiing is like, I don't believe in miracles, but it's nothing short of a miracle, I would say. That's like unbelievable, unbelievable accomplishments. Um, you know, having been there, involved in the surgery, um, the fact that you're able to make it back there, I think is a testament to, you know, not only your physical capabilities, but your, you know, your mental and your emotional uh, dedication to, um, you know, and determination to be able to recover from something like this. So uh, everybody can take a lesson from you. There's no doubt. Congratulations. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I want to take a moment to add my thanks as well. Um, I can't even imagine water skiing in the absolute best of health, let alone what you have been through. So, uh, I mean, a testament to human resilience, courage, and Keep, keep moving forward. So huge congratulations. Thank you. Tangentially, a few of us will actually be in Atlanta for a fundraising, a cancer fundraising conference at Emory at Winship in a few weeks. So uh, I may, then you know, maybe we can have a coffee. But anyway, thank you so much 
um, for your time here today. I'm just looking at the clock. I know we are at 126. I want to draw everyone's attention to the Q&A. Um, Hagit and Peter and others have been going into the question and answer and answering questions as we go. So please take a moment to go and review those to make sure you can see what's there in case your question was asked and answered. And there are some amazing questions in there. So thank you for that. Patrick, you need to take a peek as well because someone is saying hi to you. So go and look in the question and answer. There's that for you. Um, we do have time for kind of one question, maybe two, just before we wrap up. Again, it's 127. I'm just watching the, the Q&A in case anything else pops in. People are saying thank you so much. And um, this, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it for a moment, but um, this has been a fantastic dialogue and presentation. I just want to thank you all so much for for the time today. I mean, I know I learned a lot. I've been involved in cancer fundraising for over 20 years now. And this was really my first kind of deep dive. And this is, I believe, really only scratching the surface in terms of what you all are, are making possible in sarcoma. So I am incredibly impressed at what the Princess Margaret accomplishes any day, every day. And so much of that is because of the work that all of you are doing and patients worldwide are benefiting every day because of your dedication, your support, uh, and the philanthropy that it, that arises out of that. Um, I'm just going to check because I see a different number in the Q&A and I don't want to miss anything. Another thank you. So, okay, perfect. Um, so as we wrap up, I just do want to, again, thank everyone for joining us. Um, I want to thank Peter, Abba, Hajit, and, Hajit, and Patrick for uh, spending your lunch hour with us and for your incredible dedication and commitment to improving the lives of people impacted by sarcoma. I also want to quick, take a quick moment to thank someone on our team, Courtney Vandervelt, who's been leading the fundraising with the Sarcoma Group. She's heading off on maternity leave at the end of this month and has done an absolutely incredible job with CanSarc and with this team. And, uh, and we're really uh, excited for her for what, to cut, what comes next. Um, we'll be announcing soon who is joining our team to step into Courtney's shoes. I believe she's on the webinar today and we look forward to welcoming you to the team. But Courtney, on behalf of all of the patients that your work has helped facilitate through these incredible people and their team, thank you and we wish you all the best. So finally, I just one more time wanna thank you for your interest in this incredibly important work. Uh, without your support, groundbreaking ideas remain just that, ideas instead of the breakthroughs that bring us closer to conquering cancer in our lifetime. We encourage you to reach out if you'd like to learn more about cancer. You've got the website. You'll get some websites in the connection to that symposium when we send out the recording from this webinar um, or learn anything more about sarcoma work being done at the Princess Margaret. We'd be delighted to discuss it with you further. So until next time, thank you all again so much. Be well. Uh, Stay dry, avoid thunder and lightning, and enjoy spring whenever it actually comes. Thank you again on behalf of all of us at the Princess Margaret, and please enjoy the rest of your day.